Chapter Fifteen, Part One of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Fifteen, The Last Resource. The past twelve months had added several years to Edwin Reardon's seeming age. At thirty-three, he would generally have been taken for forty. His bearing, his personal habits, were no longer those of a young man. He walked with a stoop, and pressed noticeably on the stick he carried. It was rare for him to show the countenance which tells of present cheerfulness, or glad onward-looking. There was no spring in his step. His voice had fallen to a lower key, and often he spoke with that hesitation in choice of words, which may be noticed in persons whom defeat has made self-distrustful. Ceaseless perplexity and dread gave a wandering, sometimes a wild, expression to his eyes. He seldom slept, in the proper sense of the word. As a rule, he was conscious, all through the night, of a kind of fighting between physical weariness and wakeful toil of the mind. It often happened that some wholly imaginary obstacle in the story he was writing kept him under a sense of effort throughout the dark hours. Now and again he woke, reasoned with himself, and remembered clearly that the torment was without cause, but the short relief thus afforded soon passed in the recollection of real distress. In his unsoothing slumber he talked aloud, frequently wakening Amy. Generally he seemed to be holding a dialogue with someone who had imposed an intolerable task upon him. He protested passionately, appealed, argued in the strangest way about the injustice of what was demanded. Once Amy heard him begging for money, positively begging, like some poor wretch in the street. It was horrible, and made her shed tears. When he asked what he had been saying, she could not bring herself to tell him. When the striking clock summoned him remorselessly to rise and work, he often reeled with dizziness. It seemed to him that the greatest happiness attainable would be to creep into some dark, warm corner, out of the sight and memory of men, and lie there torpid, with a blessed half-consciousness that death was slowly overcoming him. Of all the sufferings collected into each four-and-twenty hours, this of rising to a new day was the worst. The one-volume story which he had calculated would take him four or five weeks was with difficulty finished in two months. March winds made an invalid of him. At one time he was threatened with bronchitis, and for several days had to abandon even the effort to work. In previous winters he had been wont to undergo a good deal of martyrdom from the London climate, but never in such a degree as now. Mental illness seemed to have enfeebled his body. It was strange that he succeeded in doing work of any kind, for he had no hope from the result. This one last effort he would make, just to complete the undeniableness of his failure, and then literature should be thrown behind him. What other pursuit was possible to him he knew not, but perhaps he might discover some mode of earning a livelihood. Had it been a question of gaining a pound a week, as in the old days, he might have hoped to obtain some clerkship like that at the hospital, where no commercial experience or aptitude was demanded. But in his present position such an income would be useless. Could he take Amy and the child to live in a garret? On less than a hundred a year it was scarcely possible to maintain outward decency. Already his own clothing began to declare him poverty-stricken, and but for gifts from her mother Amy would have reached the like pass. They lived in dread of the pettiest casual expense, for the day of pennilessness was again approaching. Amy was oftener from home than had been her custom. Occasionally she went away soon after breakfast, and spent the whole day at her mother's house. "'It saves food,' she said with a bitter laugh, when Reardon once expressed surprise that she should be going again so soon. "'And gives you an opportunity of bewailing your hard fate,' he returned coldly. The reproach was ignoble, and he could not be surprised that Amy left the house without another word to him. Yet he resented that, as he had resented her sorrowful jest." The feeling of unmanliness in his own position tortured him into a mood of perversity. Through the day he wrote only a few lines, and on Amy's return he resolved not to speak to her. There was a sense of repose in this change of attitude. He encouraged himself in the view that Amy was treating him with cruel neglect. She, surprised that her friendly questions elicited no answer, looked into his face, and saw a sullen anger of which hitherto Reardon had never seemed capable. 
Her indignation took fire, and she left him to himself. For a day or two, he persevered in his muteness, uttering a word only when it could not be avoided. Amy was at first so resentful that she contemplated leaving him to his ill temper and dwelling at her mother's house until he chose to recall her. But his face grew so haggard and fixed misery that compassionate length prevailed over her injured pride. Late in the evening she went to the study and found him sitting unoccupied. Edwin, what do you want? he asked indifferently. Why are you behaving to me like this? Surely it makes no difference to you how I behave. You can easily forget that I exist and live your own life. What have I done to make this change in you? Is it a change? You know it is. How did I behave before? he asked, glancing at her. Like yourself, kindly and gently. If I always did so, in spite of things that might have embittered another man's temper, I think it deserved some return of kindness from you. What things do you mean? Circumstances for which neither of us is to blame. I am not conscious of having failed in kindness, said Amy distantly. Then that only shows that you have forgotten your old self, and utterly changed in your feeling to me. When we first came to live here, could you have imagined yourself leaving me alone for long, miserable days, just because I was suffering under misfortunes? You have shown too plainly that you don't care to give me the help, even of a kind word. You get away from me as often as you can, as if to remind me that we have no longer any interest in common. Other people are your confidants. You speak of me to them as if I were purposely dragging you down into a mean condition. How can you know what I say about you? Isn't it true? he asked, flashing an angry glance at her. It is not true. Of course I have talked to mother about our difficulties. How could I help it? And to other people? Not in a way that you could find fault with. In a way that makes me seem contemptible to them, you show them that I have made you poor and unhappy, and you are glad to have their sympathy. What you mean is that I oughtn't to see any one. There's no other way of avoiding such a reproach as this. So long as I don't laugh and sing before people, and assure them that things couldn't be more hopeful, I shall be asking for their sympathy, and against you. I can't understand your unreasonableness. I'm afraid there is very little in me that you can understand. So long as my prospects seemed bright, you could sympathize readily enough. As soon as ever they darkened, something came between us. Amy, you haven't done your duty. Your love hasn't stood the test as it should have done. You have given me no help, besides the burden of cheerless work. I have had to bear that of your growing coldness. I can't remember one instance when you have spoken to me as a wife might, a wife who is something more than a man's housekeeper. The passion in his voice and the harshness of the accusation made her unable to reply. You said rightly, he went on, that I have always been kind and gentle. I never thought I could speak to you or feel to you in any other way. But I have undergone too much, and you have deserted me. Surely it was too soon to do that. So long as I endeavored my utmost and loved you the same as ever, you might have remembered all you once said to me. You might have given me help, but you haven't cared to. The impulses which had partook in this outbreak were numerous and complex. He felt all that he expressed. But at the same time, it seemed to him that he had the choice between two ways of uttering his emotion the tenderly appealing, and the sternly reproachful. He took the latter course, because it was less natural to him than the former. His desire was to impress Amy with the bitter intensity of his sufferings. Pathos and loving words seemed to have lost their power upon her. But perhaps if he yielded to that other form of passion, she would be shaken out of her coldness. The stress of injured love is always tempted to speech, which seems its contradiction. Reardon had the strangest mixture of pain and pleasure in flinging out these first words of wrath that he had ever addressed to Amy. They consoled him under the humiliating sense of his weakness. And yet he watched with dread his wife's countenance as she listened to him. He hoped to cause her pain equal to his own, for then it would be in his power at once to throw off this disguise and soothe her with every softest word his heart could suggest. That she had really ceased to love him he could not, durst not believe but his nature demanded frequent assurance of affection. Amy had abandoned too soon the caresses of their ardent time. She was absorbed in her maternity, and thought it enough to be her husband's friend. Ashamed to make appeal directly for the tenderness she no longer offered, he accused her of utter indifference, of abandoning him, and all but betraying him, that in self-defense she might show what really was in her heart. 
but Amy made no movement towards him. "'How can you say that I have deserted you?' she returned, with cold indignation. "'When did I refuse to share your poverty? When did I grumble at what we have had to go through?' Ever since the troubles began, you have let me know what your thoughts were, even if you didn't speak them. You have never shared my lot willingly. I can't recall one word of encouragement from you, but many, many which made the struggle harder for me. Then it would be better for you if I went away altogether, and left you free to do the best for yourself. If that is what you mean by all this, why not say it plainly? I won't be a burden to you. Someone will give me a home. And you would leave me without regret? Your only care would be that you are still bound to me? You must think of me what you like. I don't care to defend myself. You won't admit, then, that I have anything to complain of? I seem to you simply in a bad temper without a cause? To tell you the truth, that's just what I do think. I came here to ask what I have done that you were angry with me, and you break out furiously with all sorts of vague reproaches. You have much to endure, I know that, but it's no reason why you should turn against me. I have never neglected my duty. Is the duty all on my side? I believe there are very few wives who would be as patient as I have been. Reardon gazed at her for a moment, then turned away. The distance between them was greater than he had thought, and now he repented of having given way to an impulse so alien to his true feelings. Anger only estranged her, whereas by speech of a different kind he might have won the caress for which he hungered. Amy, seeing that he would say nothing more, left him to himself. It grew late in the night. The fire had gone out, but Reardon still sat in the cold room. Thoughts of self-destruction were again haunting him, as they had done during the black months of last year. If he had lost Amy's love, and all through the mental impotence which would have made it hard for him even to earn bread, why should he still live? Affection for his child had no weight with him. It was Amy's child rather than his, and he had more fear than pleasure and the prospect of Willie's growing to manhood. He had just heard the workhouse clock strike two, when, without the warning of a footstep, the door opened. Amy came in. She wore her dressing-gown, and her hair was arranged for the night. "'Why do you stay here?' she asked. It was not the same voice as before. He saw that her eyes were red and swollen. "'Have you been crying, Amy?' "'Never mind. Do you know what time it is?' He went towards her. "'Why have you been crying?' "'There are many things to cry for.' "'Amy, have you any love for me still?' or has poverty robbed me of it all? I have never said that I didn't love you. Why do you accuse me of such things? He took her in his arms and held her passionately, and kissed her face again and again. Amy's tears broke forth anew. Why should we come to such utter ruin? she sobbed. Oh, try, try if you can't save us even yet. You know without my saying it that I do love you. It's dreadful to me to think that all our happy life should be at an end, when we thought of such a future together. Is it impossible? Can't you work as you used to, and succeed as we felt confident you would? Don't despair yet, Edwin. Do, do try, whilst there is still time. Darling, darling, if only I could! I have thought of something, dearest. Do as you proposed last year. Find a tenant for the flat whilst we still have a little money, and then go away into some quiet country place, where you can get back your health and live for very little. And write another book, a good book, that'll bring you reputation again. I and Willie can go and live at Mother's for the summer months. Do this. It would cost you so little, living alone, wouldn't it? You would know that I was well cared for. Mother would be willing to have me for a few months. And it's easy to explain that your health has failed, that you're obliged to go away for a time. But why shouldn't you go with me, if we are to let this place? We shouldn't have enough money. I want to free your mind from the burden whilst you are writing. And what is before us if we go on in this way? You don't think you will get much for what you're writing now, do you? Reardon shook his head. Then how can we live even till the end of the year? Something must be done, you know. If we get into poor lodgings, what hope is there that you'll be able to write anything good? But, Amy, I have no faith in my power of— Oh, it would be different. A few days, a week, or a fortnight of real holiday in the spring weather. Go to some seaside place. How is it possible that all your talent should have left you? It's only that you have been so anxious, and in such poor health. You say I don't love you, but I have thought and thought what would be best for you to do, how you could save yourself. How can you sink down to the position of a poor clerk in some office? That can't be your fate, Edwin. It's incredible. Oh, after such bright hopes, make one more effort. 
"'Have you forgotten that we were to go to the South together? "'You were to take me to Italy and Greece. "'How can that ever be if you fail utterly in literature? "'How can you ever hope to earn more than bare sustenance "'at any other kind of work?' "'He all but lost consciousness of her words, "'in gazing at the face she held up to his. "'You love me? Say again that you love me.' Dear, I love you with all my heart, but I am so afraid of the future. I can't bear poverty. I have found that I can't bear it. And I dread to think of your becoming only an ordinary man. Reardon laughed. But I am not only an ordinary man, Amy. If I never write another line, that won't undo what I have done. It's little enough, to be sure, but you know what I am. Do you only love the author in me? Don't you think of me apart from all that I may do or not do? If I had to earn my living as a clerk, would that make me a clerk in soul? You shall not fall to that. It would be too bitter a shame to lose all you have gained in these long years of work. Let me plan for you. Do as I wish. You are to be what we hoped from the first. Take all the summer months. How long will it be before you can finish this short book? A week or two. Then finish it, and see what you can get for it. And try at once to find a tenant to take this place off our hands. That would be twenty-five pounds saved for the rest of the year. You could live on so little by yourself, couldn't you? Oh, on ten shillings a week, if need be. But not to starve yourself, you know. Don't you feel that my plan is a good one? When I came to you tonight, I meant to speak of this. But you were so cruel. Forgive me, dearest love. I was half a madman. You have been so cold to me for a long time. I have been distracted. It was as if we were drawing nearer and nearer to the edge of a cataract. End of chapter 15, part 1